Good afternoon. Welcome to the live stream for Friday, March 26th of 2021. It's one o'clock on Friday, so it must be live stream. And uh, we just thought we'd cut off at the beginning of that song so we could get that song stuck in your head. Wasn't that thoughtful of us? In any case, welcome <clears throat> to this Friday's episode of Livestream PD. Uh, today we will have a special ed Q&A with the LSL Special Ed Teachers on Special Assignment, Lisa and Michelle. But before, we have some announcements as we always do. The first thing is a reminder again that updates are coming to student Chromebooks. Uh, if you have a teacher Chromebook, updates are coming to yours as well. And whenever on your Macs that you see the little update next to your name, go ahead and click that. You have to relaunch Chrome to update to make sure all your features are working correctly. Same thing is true with the kiddos. Uh, try and get them to make sure they restart their Chromebooks at least once a week. Um, so as you know, there's an MOU. It's, uh, it's beginning to look a lot like hybrid. Um, in any case, after we come back from spring break, uh, teachers and students will be mostly returning in a hybrid mode. And that means some changes for us in how we support you. Um, edtech at alisal.org is not going anywhere. So you can email that for all of your edtech support needs. But office hours, we have some changes coming. So the week after spring break will be Wednesday only because uh, George and Celia have a professional development that they're attending on Thursday. So that week of April 5th, which we start on April 6th because of Easter, will be Wednesday only. Then after that, uh, moving to the week of April 12th to the end of the school year will be Mondays only from 1 to 3 p.m. And we're moving it off of Wednesdays and Thursdays, obviously, because if you're teaching in the hybrid mode, you will be teaching every afternoon in our old office hours time. And Monday is the collab and planning day. So we figured it would be better to move it into where teachers have actual time to come and get the help. The help is still bit.ly slash LSL help, still case sensitive. So again, office hours moving, there will be an email. And I'm sure it'll be in the EdTech Weekly as well. Um, join us next week for Spring break, yes, you made it. Uh, you made it to a pretty significant milestone in this year of COVID teaching. Um, so I couldn't find it, but there's a meme that I saw on Facebook where it says, you know, teachers teaching during COVID and it's a person just keeping their head out of the water. And then the next meme is uh, everyone telling me to practice self-care. Like, so I'm not gonna tell you that. I'm not gonna tell you to relax. I'm gonna tell you, do whatever feels most useful, productive, relaxing, whatever you need the most, do that now. Um, so with no more uh, announcements or no further ado, we would like to welcome Lisa and Michelle to uh, unmute, to turn on their cameras and take it away. Just start presenting and you will override my presentation. Thank you very much for joining us today, Lisa and Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. I loved your DJ. <laughs> Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to our special ed Q&A session. I'm Lisa Larison. I'm Michelle Lynch. And today we are going to try to tackle your burning questions about special ed. Uh, Celia put out a, a survey a while ago and we took all of the questions that related to special ed and we are trying to um, address all of those today. Um, at first we didn't think that uh, any of them grouped together but the more we looked at it the more we saw that um, there were a lot about SPED and gen ed collaboration and so we want to introduce you to becoming friends. Uh, strategies about how we can do it online, uh, engagement, what works, uh, a little bit about breakout rooms, and so we're gonna give you some reasons to try them. Um, SSTs, when to do them, how to do them, uh, some speech questions, and we got some answers straight from the experts. And then there were some add-ons about 
IEPs in 504. So we're going to try and answer all of those questions for you today. How can special ed and general ed teachers collaborate on progress for progress reports, report cards, and annual IEPs? Um, we, Michelle provided us with this free editable weekly student progress, which is just, an, um, just a suggestion. There are many out there that you can use, but like one page things really uh, work for communication back and forth. Be responsive and communicative when either is asking for help or information. And work as a team. This is really key. Um, we are working toward the common goal of the child and growing and moving, progressing in the gen ed curriculum. And then respect each other's expertise. Uh, utilize your strengths and focus on what you can do for that child. How can I collaborate with special ed teachers when they aren't always at GLTs? Both general ed and special ed teachers need to find a time to communicate and collaborate. GLTs is not the only time that um, you guys, uh, that the team can collaborate. These are just suggestions that we've seen work. Um, email and Hangouts, we have utilized that extensively since we've been in COVID land and um, it works really well. Um, there are sheets that you can exchange each week to help communicate the, the example we gave previously and to be persistent. I know my email piles up, it's very hard to answer all the emails and um, just be, continue trying to communicate. Um, question, how do we meet the student's needs when we don't have knowledge of the goals on the IEP? Talk with the special ed teacher. General ed teacher should receive a copy of the IEP. And I know in the past this has been an issue of confidentiality, but at this point now we are um, able to provide the entire copy of the IEP, which includes the accommodations um, to use on the LPAC or the SBAC and um, the goals that the student is working towards in gen ed and in special ed and it, it just lays it out so you can all work on the same, same areas as a team. Um, what support is available for teachers struggling with meeting student needs? The RSP teacher should be a resource to the general ed education teachers, as well as the rest of the SPED staff. Okay, so, uh, then there was questions about how we can differentiate for special ed students um, at their level. So just to, to remind everyone, the goal is that um, our special ed students, for the most part, are going to be working towards um, the Common Core standards and um, learning it, the general ed curriculum. So you need to take a look at those accommodations um, that are listed in the IEP. It's on IEP 6A. Um, and those are decided at the IEP meeting. So it's again, that's the reason it's so important that general ed teachers are at the IEP meeting so that they can be part of that discussion and deciding what kinds of things that student needs in order to be successful. Um, and what kind of supports do they need in order to do the same tasks that everybody else is doing in the class? So they may need text to speech or speech to text lots of scaffolding always, graphic organizers, they might need an abridged version of the same text if you can find it, um, using manipulatives, whether they're virtual manipulatives or things that they can really touch and hold. Um, always talk with your special ed teacher. They should be a, a big resource for you. Um, whole brain teaching, if you are not familiar with whole brain teaching, it's mostly um, multi-sensory approach. So it's visual, it's auditory, it's kinesthetic, doing it all at the same time. Uh, a lots of fun based uh, approach. And universal design for learning where you're providing choices in different places that um, will help them. 
Another question that um, people asked about was extra support for non-readers in the upper grades. So this is a, a harder question to answer because what does that mean? What kind of gaps do the, does the student actually have? Are we talking about they're having difficulty with decoding? Or are we talking about difficulties with comprehension? Um, so the first step, I think, is always to find out what are the gaps that they have so that you can really address those. Um, if you're talking about uh, decoding, I would suggest uh, the BPST. Um, and then form targeted interventions on those things that they're struggling with, and then progress monitor. Um, you can talk with your RSP teacher also to find out what would be appropriate for that student and which accommodations to use, um, but it, it needs to be individualized. Um, there are some strategies that really do help, especially kids with um, that are older, that have some knowledge base, um, do they know their um, prefixes and suffixes? Do they know the that um, OW can say O like snow and um, OW like plow? And that if if they try one of them and it doesn't work, maybe they can try the other one and it'll work, so that they can really chunk those um, those sections and put it together. Um, a lot of those kids are still doing like one sound at a time. And if they're in fifth grade still doing that, that's gonna be a problem. Um, but again, it has to be individualized because each kid is different, they have different gaps. So what technology tools do I integrate into my remote instruction to make the instruction accessible? like voice to text as I help my RSP students prepare for upcoming state tests. So I did put a link to um, how to turn on accessibility features for Chromebooks, but it may not be what you need to do. So um, there's the text to speech. This is um, for speech to text, but you wanna look in the IEP on the accommodations page to see if that's something that the team decided that student actually needs. Unless you're doing it for your whole class, it has to be in the IEP. Um, so, so get that help from the um, your resource teacher or if you're if it's a mainstream student um, that's included in your class from an SDC class, uh, talk to them. So another question was, how do I scaffold for students that have different developmental disabilities for remote instruction? Um, zone of proximal development, uh, what can your students do without any help? Go one thing further, what can they do if they have some guidance? You don't wanna take a quantum leap and try to get them to do something that's way outside their comfort zone. They're not gonna be able to do it. Um, but things you might want to ask yourself are what are the prerequisite skills? Do they have those prerequisite skills? If they don't, maybe you want to spend some time trying to teach some of those prerequisite skills first. And how do I do this in the classroom when we're back at school and why? Can you adapt that to what you're doing now? Do I normally give them manipulatives? Can they do this with manipulatives now? Can they do it with virtual manipulatives? You need to think about some of those things. Um, possible strategies, and we're gonna repeat a lot of the same things today because um, you know, it's the, they're the same things that we always use. Uh, UDL strategies, get them engaged, visuals, songs, uh, communication cards, which is what these are here. If you've got some um, autistic kids in your class, if you have um, very low functioning, life skills kids, um, and you know, you can hold up those cards and find a way to get them to choose one or the other um, to get them to communicate back with you. Um, but visuals for any kids are always important. Uh, graph graphic organizers, Realia, um, Reader's Theater, sorry. I'm missing my, oh, interactive uh, 
online activities like boom cards or um, especially for those really young ones uh, with low cognitive abilities uh, are helpful. Um, how do I support students that may need special education during remote asynchronous times? So because they're by themselves or may not have anybody at home who can um, say, keep going, get on this, get it done, whatever, teaching those self-monitoring skills uh, is really important. Um, we're always trying to promote independence anyways, but any, any way that you can get them to, um, to work without somebody being there with them is gonna be helpful. Uh, they might need text-to-speech. If they're not uh, strong readers, they might need to be able to have it read to them first, or um, they might need to speak um, and then have it write for them if they're not strong readers or writers for a time, you know, especially if they don't have the help um, in the meantime. Checklists, checklists, checklists. Um, find ways to reward and motivate them. Um, maybe you can offer them some time if you get your asynchronous work done um, and are able to turn it in, I'm gonna give you five minutes to talk with a friend of yours, you know, or whatever, something that's gonna make them feel good and make them feel like uh, there's a reason for what I did. Um, set up schedules so that they know and they follow the same schedule every day. Set up timers and notifications. I know that they mess with them, but at least if they know how to set them up and and when to set them up, some of your kids will take advantage of that. And if you were not um, at the training about hyperdocs at the um, Good Teaching Conference, I highly recommend that you click on some of these links. Um, and the lady who did the presentation said that it was okay to share, um, but it was really, good <laughs> it's really helpful you put all of your a whole lesson on um on a doc and this is a good example of it that she gave also about the human digestive system you engage them you put a hyperlink in there with something for them to uh to get them engaged in in your lesson maybe do another thing so there's a little activity for them to do. Then you have them explore with another link, the digestive system. Then it explains it in a video. And then you have to do some, um, some kind of activity. And it's not exactly, you know, that every time, but it's, it's things that will really get them involved and they go from one thing to the next so that you have your whole um, lesson right there and it's really easy for them to do and they're engaged in it and I just thought it was a really good idea. Um, so check those out, that might be helpful. Thanks, Michelle. I like those hyperdocs, those are really cool. Okay, so how do I integrate social emotional learning in special education? Counselors, just a reminder that counselors also discussed this in a previous um, live stream. So in a self-contained classroom, uh, you can utilize buddies, uh, buddy students up with, uh, you know, uh, higher or lower levels, however you wanna do it. Uh, mindfulness is a wonderful tool for you and the kids. Allow um, drawing journals or drawing. This has been a huge piece um, in allowing the, the kids who can't uh, you know, get it out to, to allow them to draw or, or uh, write down how they feel they can do that. Um, brain breaks, that's... <laughs> I know we're all exhausted with our brain now in this distance learning, so those are key. And allow time to socialize um, at the beginning of the class or perhaps in breakout rooms or some type of a time in between like transitions and things like that where they can team up with someone, talk about their day, debrief, whatever. 
in the RSPA related services um, area, uh, ch they use check in at the beginning and um, of the session and check out like, how you doing? Uh, they gauge the kind of the lesson and how in deep they're gonna go um, on how the student is, is doing. Um, also take deep breaths, it's key. Then allow a, a place and a time to journal and draw. Like we, we keep on mentioning this, but this is a very good way to get your students engaged. Calming activities. There's the breathing, the mindfulness, stretching, something to just um, relax because we are so high anxiety these days. And then take breaks when you need them. <clears throat> the question was, engagement is a problem. How do I keep them engaged? Um, and right now I think we all feel like some of our kids aren't engaged as much as they should be. And I think it's just the, the time, you know, the, the COVID time. Um, so it, it's across the board. And so you just try to create connections, get to know what they're interested in or, or just talk to them and let them, you know, uh, talk about things that they want to talk about. Look at why they might not be engaged. Um, your, re your reality. Um, sometimes that's hard to face, but what is the reality? I mean, there, there could be a lot of things um, hindering this child from moving forward. Uh, here's a, 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 a doc that you can uh, click on. And so um, what needs, so, so it kind of gives you an idea of what might be causing the misbehavior in the classroom that like the, you know, really get down to the nitty gritty. Why are they misbehaving? Is it like, you know, um, for a certain reason or, you know, because something happened to them or, you know, w whatever. But this is a great opportunity here to um, just see what behaviors are, are you're, you're observing and what you can do. Uh, the next one is 25 teaching tips for remote um, to engage students in distance learning. So um, this has a lot of information and there's tons of stuff um, out there under this category. So many people have some great ideas. So just avert your eyes from the right-hand side of the screen, <laughs> focus on the, the words there. Um, but these are excellent resources and they just kind of bounce and, and kind of, you know, go to this one, go to this one. So and another excellent resource. Um, how do I help SPED students who are not self-motivated and require one-on-one -on -one or very small group instruction? So this kind of follows from the previous slide. Um, get them interested. What are they interested in? I, um, I remember sometimes I, I would uh, get some comic books or things like that, that where it was a more of a picture than, than words and um, the kids loved that. Um, start with uh, what they can do, not what they can't do. I think we're really focusing on what they can't do and we're pressured to, to do that, but I think that you can strive to, to notice what they are doing. Um, if they have trouble writing things down, have them record themselves speaking first. And um, you know maybe you can utilize the speak uh, text to speech or speech to text to help them. Um, can you give them a job to keep them engaged? I, that's, they all wanted to have jobs and be responsible and feel like they're needed and, and um, can contribute to the class. Um, if they have trouble expressing themselves, have them draw pictures and then see what they can tell you, write or label. And then you can bring those words into a sentence, uh, just step by step. Um, if they have trouble with math, you can give them manipulatives to do calculations. And I'm sure you've asked them to use beans or pasta or um, utensils or something like that. I mean, it can go in both, you know, face-to-face -face teaching in the classroom and at, at home. Um, can they draw the word problem first before they try to solve it? Um, these are also some UDL strategies, you know, give them a lot of choices. Can they work with partner or in groups? This, this helps a lot with um, connecting with same age peers. 
Okay, so the, we got a question on ways to use breakout rooms. Um, small group instruction uh, with the teacher or the paraeducator. We have seen this um, work and um, uh, kids seem to enjoy it. Um, you can think pair share in the breakout rooms and you can, you can um, do it for a short period of time. I've been in it, you know, as long as three minutes, five minutes, you know, you can, you can um, gauge that to your kids. Um, you can use it for collaborative small group discussion or some work time. You know, maybe some kids need a little bit quieter time uh, without so much noise. Um, like you can, uh, you know, use them in, in chunks of uh, smaller times. So if you don't quite trust your kids yet or something like that, um, also you can use them for centers. And then once we go back to, um, you know, in, in person instruction, you can uh, break it up the same way into, into uh, centers in your classroom. So you may need to have, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> you, um, okay, I already said that, so time sessions. Thank you, Michelle. Can move to the next slide. Sorry about that. No, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. Okay, no worries. <laughs> um, so another thing someone asked was, should students who don't submit synchronous work be referred for an initial IEP? So no, not turning in work is not a disability. And so that's not going to be something that um, I would say that you need to refer to special ed for. However, you may want to um, if you've if you've tried things and you can't think of what else to do with that student, um, it you might want to have an SST so that you have um, a team of people who can look at the situation and provide some other um, things um, that might be helpful, some other interventions or other um, strategies, um, and to help you develop a plan for how to get that student motivated and getting um, getting that work turned in. Um, remember that it's important to document and to be specific about the interventions and the progress um, that they're making with it. And uh, you might see patterns that will help you um, figure out what the real problem is, what the underlying issue is that would um, help you to solve the problem. Um, so another question was about SSTs and documenting interventions, uh, how to document. So your assistant principal is going to be the one who's most likely in charge of um, SSTs on your campus. So you want to make sure you talk to them and get the right forms. Uh, you do want to make sure that you are being specific and targeted in your interventions. You want to make sure that you include the dates. Uh, the duration of sessions and in, of the interventions, like 15 minutes, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays for six weeks, whatever. Um, what was the goal of the activity? Um, if you put decoding, that might be accurate, but you might also want to say um, that you're really trying to focus on short vowel sounds or um, blending. Uh, you also want to make sure that you have baseline data because how do you know if you've made progress if you don't have um, where they started from? And you want to have progress monitoring data with numbers, not just anecdotal data. You want to see they were at this percentile and they moved to this percentile. Or they knew this many letter sounds and now they know this many letter sounds. Um, and how can I do the interventions? Uh, you can use breakout rooms. You can use uh, self-guided computer programs like Lexia. Um, you could utilize your uh, some office hours so you can do one-on-one -on -one or small group time. So another question was about um, SSTs during COVID. How relevant will potential data gathered uh, in SSTs be con considered considering the circumstances. Uh, would this year actually count towards a potential referral to SPED, assuming multiple SST meetings are held, or will this year in a way not count and delay 
the process even further. So um, did you have SST meetings? If you had SST meetings, those should count. Um, did you document interventions with data on progress, hard evidence data? Um, then yes, it should count. Um, but you might also need to consider where where is the rest of your class um, this year, since it's a weird year, and then where is that student in comparison to where your kids are now, and maybe not necessarily where your kids should be or where they usually would be. Um, but again, that's why we have a team of people together to help us to answer those questions and figure out, is this really appropriate? Or do we need to do other interventions um, first? And you are still going to need to consider um, attendance and participation because we always consider those things. But you need to work together and we make team decisions, correct? And that is correct, Michelle. Okay, so another one of the questions was about speech. So who determines the set 90 minutes a month for speech services? Can there be given more time? And the answer, okay, and we did, um, we asked our experts, our SLPs, and they, these are the answers that they gave us. <clears throat> yes, they can, it is always a team decision. Just my opinion, we often give 90 minutes monthly of speech therapy as a minimum service. It is a t the team who decides whether or not the child needs more. It is my understanding that speech and language is promoted in the classroom setting due to rich language-based academics. Another colleague says, However, the team balances out the severity of the needs and the necessities of being in class and not missing academic instruction. And that's a big one um, that we had to deal with during COVID is, you know, we uh, special ed needed to work around the gen ed times. And so um, it can be, you know, um, complicated, but um, it, it can work. Okay, how are we accommodating students with a speech and language impediment? Um, teachers can best accommodate students with speech and language impairment by providing them opportunities for increased verbal response time. Give them a warning before letting them answer in class. Um, this helps them process and think about their answer so they are confident in giving the answer um, and participating in class. Frequent checks for understanding. Balance service times so as not to miss academic instruction. There it is again. Uh, for students who stutter during a time fluency reading test, you can um, uh, measure their decoding skills and reading comprehension skills without the time piece. That takes away the anxiety and you can still get what you, the information and data that you need. Okay, next slide, please. I kind of combined the two there. <laughs> Thank you. And this is you. So, uh, another question that we got was, uh, what do I do if I don't think administration, site, or district level is following protocol or laws with regards to the 504 plan and or IEP? So I would say that the first thing you always need to do is um, talk to the administrator or whoever it is you're having issues with. Um, make sure that you're not, it's not a, just a misunderstanding because it's possible that it is. Happens all the time. Um, you might want to look up the laws uh, yourself to make sure that you are not misunderstanding or that, and that you are correct um, in what you're saying. Uh, and there are many laws and sometimes uh, those laws conflict with each other. So um, see where your administrator is coming from. Um, but if you still feel that they are wrong, it's really important to go up the chain of command and not go straight to, you know, the superintendent or whatever. Um, and always be respectful. It's very important that you're always respectful, even when you disagree with people. Um, as far as going up the chain of command, you might want to even start with your 
um, speech or your um, special ed team at your site and see if they agree with you or disagree with you. Maybe they've got a different take on it. Maybe they are seeing the situation differently. Maybe they know some things that uh, you're not aware of that you could, um, that might help you. Um, if that's not helpful, you can always come to Lisa and I, um, and maybe we can try to figure it out or smooth out the situation. If not, you can go up to Dorian, who's the program manager of special ed. Um, you can go to um, Mr. Hadamil, who's the director of special ed. Um, you can always go to SELPA after that. If you really think these people don't know what they're doing, they're not doing it right, whatever, um, and they can help you. Um, but start at the lowest level first and try to work things out. There was another question. Oh, sorry. No, okay. no sorries. You cracked me up, Michelle. Okay, 504s. Who, this question, I um, we, we just got, so <laughs> um, who at the sites are in charge of 504 plans? If not at the sites, then for the district. So the assistant principals are in charge of the 504s at the school site. And Dr. Hernandez is in charge of the SSTs and 504 plans at the district level. Okay, so another question uh, about 504s and IEPs. Um, is there a manual for me to look at that outlines what the process for 504 plans, IEPs, test, testing should follow? For example, is there a county office that has oversight or, is this, or a state department? So 504s is um, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, so you can look that up if you want to. Um, IEPs, the main law about IEPs is um, the Individuals with D Disabilities in Education Act, which is a federal law. Um, there's also information in the SELPA handbook. Uh, SELPA is the special education local plan area, and so they're in charge of special ed for Monterey County. Um, well, ours is. Um, and the California Department of Ed um, has, you know, all the laws about, um, about education, and then um, within that, laws about uh, special ed. Uh, testing, I found a chart that is um, from the SELPA handbook um, about assessments and reassessments. I am not positive if this is what was being asked about specifically for testing. If this does not answer your question, um, chapter four of the SELPA handbook is all about assessments. And there are also other charts um, in the handbook. Um, there's one in probably chapter three that's more about like initials um, and how you get to testing. So if that was your question, you might want to look there. Um, we provided some links um, at the side here. Um, there's a parent's guide to 504s, uh, rights law is a great resource. Um, it's mainly directed at parents, but I know I often look there um, and it's good for teachers as well um, that talk about special ed law. Um, there's a self book procedural handbook and the California Department of Education um, special ed. Special ed. Um, so hopefully one of these will answer the questions that you have on where to look. Okay, so another question here was, are students being tested? Will students be served? And the answer is yes and yes. Um, on certain sites, um, assessment has been going on since we've been closed, um, and testing and assessment, same thing. Um, we have had trouble with some of the speech services, uh, finding people and um, getting them to do services, but it's being worked on and um, we're finding people to fill those positions. So, um, yes. And uh, these were all things that sounded like a SPED issue to me. So it sounded like these were 
questions from special ed teachers. Um, if that's not correct, then I apologize. But um, so creating assessments that are aligned to IEP goals, um, I did put together a, a presentation for that that I had planned on doing earlier and then didn't get scheduled. Um, but I will be doing that for special ed teachers um, soon. Uh, is there any special education Spanish curriculum? Not that I know of. I don't believe that we have any um, Spanish curriculum for special ed. Um, and how do I get test results off Illuminate and how do I access Wonders? So I put a link here for how to find LPAC scores in Illuminate. And Wonders, I know that um, they were trying to get extra licenses for that. And Elizabeth Nahara in IT was the one uh, that said that she was going to work on that. So I believe that's who you would um, contact and see if they ever got those uh, licenses. Um, and as far as teaching writing remotely, I think that um, there have been some things about, um, about doing that. So I didn't want to tackle that here and now, um, but um, possibly in the future, I can also work on, on doing that. Um, With the hyperlinks. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so those were all of the questions that we um, originally had. I know we moved through some of them a little bit quickly, um, and I hope that we were able to answer them fully. And if not, then, you know, always ask again and we'll try to be more specific. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, ladies, for that. Just by popular demand, one of the most popular comments or questions has been, can we get the slide deck? So yes, when we are, because you guys provided some great resources. So when we are done here, this will be posted to the remote instruction website. Uh, Lisa and Michelle have already provided that for us. So be on the lookout for that soon after we are done here with with the uh, live stream pd there's a couple of questions so here goes celia mm, i mean i think yeah i think we're it's really only one so if there are any like lingering questions feel free to send them in right quick but um there's just one question and i feel like it's more of a statement just saying um in terms of ieps um, getting teachers a copy of a student's IEP at the beginning of the year. So maybe can you guys clarify, like, when would I receive an IEP copy for my student? Do I get it at the beginning of the year? Should it be from the AP, like you've mentioned? So maybe some clarity there. So I, I think that you should get it from your RSP teacher. RSP teacher should be getting um, the copy of the IEP to general ed teachers at the beginning of the year. You should definitely know what the goals are. You should definitely know what the accommodations for in the classes. I know that um, when I was an RSP teacher, I before um, LPAC or before um, SPAC, even if I had already given you a copy, I tried to make sure that you had a copy um, of at least that page so that you knew precisely what those accommodations were. Um, so if you haven't done that, RSP teachers, you should be doing that. Um, so make sure that happens. <laughs> and um, I don't know if that ends. So, and if you don't get something um, in the beginning of the year, ask your RSP teacher. Uh, you know, it goes both ways. I, yes, they should do that. But if they don't, for whatever reason, talk to them, collaborate, ask questions. Yeah, and in the SDC special day class realm, um, a lot of them we need to start mainstreaming more or they are mainstreaming and that's when we would also share the IEP with that teacher who they're mainstreaming and any accommodations and modifications that are done and that sort of a thing. Thank you. Um, there's one more question actually that came in, this is usual, right? <laughs> um, this is from Heather Burns at Creekside. Where's the SELPA handbook at each school site? The SELPA handbook is online. So it's not a physical document, at least not that I know of. It's, it's that link that I shared. Um, I'd be happy to uh, share it with uh, Ms. Burns, no problem. 
So I think that is it. So uh, yeah, so that those links will be our live and people can go ahead and click on them. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Once we get again this slide deck on the live stream live stream PD webpage for you. But I don't see anything else coming in. So uh Josh, uh, I don't know. I'll let you take over. Well, I just want to say uh, thank you again to Lisa and Michelle. It's a lot of, and, and all the teachers and, and folks who came in, not came in, who sent in their, um, their questions early because that is really important and, and it gave them some time to, you know, really formulate thoughtful answers and really put their some resources together. Look out for those slides. Um, Lisa and Michelle, thank you so much. And thank you for supporting all the general ed teachers and the special ed teachers as well. Um, so there being no further ado, we have an announcement of our own as well. So as you know, next week, I'm looking up at the calendar. I'm not like weirdly looking away from camera. Um, next week is spring break. And then the week after that, the Tuesday the 6th to Friday the 9th, we will be, teachers will all be coming back to school barring medical accommodation. So uh, you'll be doing remote instruction that week and then getting your rooms ready and all that sort of stuff. So we will not be having a live stream on the 9th. One, the live stream PD is part of the remote instruction, also known as the phase one MOU. The phase two MOU does not have a live stream and frankly, your lives will be plenty busy enough. Um, and so we feel like the live stream has run its course. We're not gonna ask anyone. Technically, you're still in remote instruction under the phase one MOU on the 9th, but you need that time for yourselves. So um, for the 80 folks who are still with us, uh, you can spread the word. There will be an email announcement along with the announcement about uh, the change in office hours. But this is the last live stream. It feels like some sort of a milestone in, in a, a year of, of the, you know, a, a journal of the COVID year. Um, so this is us saying goodbye and uh, that it's been our honor and pleasure to provide the live stream for you. And that obviously we're always um, just an email or a Google meet or a phone call away. Um, and so for the last time, unless George or Celia would like to say anything before I close. or I can just sit here and make faces at the camera. For the last time, I would like to say thank you. <laughs> George, go ahead. He just, he blinked on. Go ahead, George. You're muted. Classic. I know, classic. We have to do this on the last day, of course. We were just wanting to say, you know, we thought about this kind of thinking back and just thank all of you that subscribe to the yearly plan because now it's over. So uh, yeah, um, it's been a pleasure. And, uh, you know, hopefully you've found some value in this. Right. You're your trial, your your one year trial, free trial of the live stream PD is over, and we are not continuing the service at this time. Um, but in any case, to close out on behalf of George, Celia, and myself, as we say every at the end of every one of these, be good to yourself, be good to yourselves, be good to each other, and be good to our kids. Thank you so much, and we wish you fortitude and luck in the remaining eight weeks we have left of this school year. Thank you and goodbye.